Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here, PopTech. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Letha. Thank you, John. So uh, I want to talk about our bodies, about machines, and about how the intersection of the two uh, creates a new uh, interaction with our physical environment, the places we live in. Now, this is an old topic uh, that now becomes, uh, uh, gains new relevance because of the vast transformations we see in technologies, so machines change, and the environments we live in, the environments we uh, inhabit, uh, are dramatically transformed. We've gone urban, right? Uh, we've gone urban and it's just increasing, right? Today we're at about 54% urban and the expectation is that, is that by 2050 we'll be uh, over two-thirds uh, of the planet uh, uh, urbanized. It's almost as many people will live in cities as there are on the entire planet today. Now, cities are important for many reasons. I'll give just a few numbers, for example, but there are many others. They cover 2% of the Earth's uh, inhabitable land area. They, oops, sorry. They consume uh, over two-thirds of the energy on the planet and in turn emit more than 75% of CO2 or CO2 equivalent. So it's a big deal. They also create more than 80% of the world's GDP. So if you think about it, if you can do something about the challenges that cities face, you've impacted the whole planet. Now, at the same time, we're seeing a big transformation in technology. We all know what it's about, right? We're carrying very uh, strong computers in our pockets today so we can communicate with each other in many ways, wherever we are, pretty much. Uh, we can consume data from machines as we move around. Our valuables, our cars, are becoming instrumented with sensors, so they begin to talk back to us and we can talk to them. You can slap one of those, this is a standard machine-to-machine -machine modem, on almost anything out there, and it goes online. So one way to think about it is that there is this digital layer that integrates itself with our physical environment and allows us to do a whole bunch of quite powerful things to make life better in the places we live in. Now, one thing uh, is to be able to read information from our environment, right? to synchronize urban infrastructures, to quantify our bodies, uh, uh, to, uh, to measure. Another thing is to actuate our environment, to actually close a feedback loop and begin uh, to be able to take action. So uh, robotics, I mean, we've had uh, uh, old ideas about humanoid robots. They, uh, they are becoming uh, increasingly possible today. Um, Robots are a great way uh, to take action and to actuate our environments. We're seeing industrial robots uh, proliferating factories throughout the world. Robots begin to disappear into our everyday objects. For example, the self-driving car. Even more interesting is when they disappear into our bodies and give us new capabilities. So what we asked ourselves back, uh, back in the day at the Sensible City Lab at MIT uh, is how can we take advantage of this new condition uh, to improve urban mobility? We've done many other projects, but specifically today, I'm going to focus on how can this new condition allow us uh, to address some of the most pressing uh, problems uh, of urbanization. Now, mobility is an issue most of us uh, have stood in traffic at least once in our life, uh, and it crosses uh, international boundaries. It happens everywhere. Uh, it has great cost to it. Uh, it also sucks, right? It's not just about the environment, <laughs> right? It's, it's a terrible way to spend your time. And it's, it's only going to get worse. That's one of the big issues, right? So with the growth in urban population, uh, demand for urban transport is going to increase. So much so that by 2050, we're expected to have more than two and a half times more demand for transport. So think of places, for example, like LA, like Mexico City, like, like Lagos. What will happen if you had two and a half times more traffic over there, right? It's dysfunctional today already. It's impossible, right? Now, and that's irrespective of what kind of fuel we use in our cars. So we have to think about something new. And people are beginning to get it. You're looking here in the United States, uh, use of public transport is on the rise for almost a decade and a half, steady and quite steep, right? Miles driven on highways is going down. Miles driven per capita anywhere in Europe is in steady decline since the early 90s. 
If you look at the young US generation here, people are getting a driver's license at a later and later age. So also, uh, the emotional connection, uh, people's attitude toward the automobile is shifting as well. And that's interesting. We're seeing a bicycle renaissance happening, right? This is, a, this is an image from New York. Uh, in the United States, there's a steady increase uh, in cycling. The numbers are still quite low, but it's becoming uh, more and more a way to move around, not just a way of recreation. We're seeing bike sharing programs appearing in, in many major cities throughout the world. Uh, but there is a fundamental issue with this. Since the introduction of the automobile, we've stretched our cities mainly because we could, right? So we started living farther and farther from where we work and where we spend time with our friends and families. Cities have, gone, have grown so big that it became almost impossible for most of us to move through them without the help of a motor, right? Some of them are also placed in funny topographies like this one. So we partnered back in the day with the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen and we asked, how can we get more people to cycle using technology? Very simple question, right? We didn't know the answer to this. We thought maybe it's you know, two shots of coffee. Who knows? Uh, now, it's an interesting question to ask in Copenhagen because they were a car city uh, until uh, the early 70s and took a whole bunch of actions uh, to become uh, more cycling friendly. And that's what it's like today. Image dead. Never mind. There are more bikes than people there. Uh, and 55% of the trips are done by bike in the city center, 33 uh, in the metro area. Um, we've studied the place and realized that uh, 15 kilometers is sort of an invisible boundary where people begin uh, to cycle far less. And it sort of makes sense, right? Uh, roughly 10 miles, 9 miles. Uh, it's, quite, it's about half an hour if you really ride fast. It could take you an hour in a normal city. People are not willing to spend that kind of time and effort on a one-way uh, uh, ride. Hills are a big deterrent as well. We've studied many other cities and realized it's quite consistent. So what we've decided to do is instead of rethinking the bike completely, bikes are great, they're very efficient, there are many uh, great companies and boutique shops that make fabulous bikes around the world. At best, we can make an incremental improvement. But when it comes to robotics, when it comes to design, uh, when it comes to control systems, we can make uh, a big dent. So we decided to create almost like an exoskeleton that would go on your bike, something that would just enhance your range uh, and make the city available for you again on a bicycle. This is what we came up with. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Copenhagen wheel. And the red part can go on any bike, almost any bike. And it has everything you need in it to propel you through the city. It was a two and a half, long year, um, research, uh, two and a half uh, year long research project at MIT uh, with a whole bunch of students and researchers. And, uh, we showed it to the world, and, uh, and people liked it, so much so that I decided uh, to go part-time and uh, founded this company called Super Pedestrian. We spun the project out of MIT and created a, a, a team in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a team of robotics engineers for the most part, who work with designers on making uh, competitive alternatives to the car. So what's inside the wheel? Sorry. Let me try to restart this. Uh, is uh, seven uh, boards, basically three little computers, um, a motor, batteries, 12 sensors. It's online. Uh, you uh, basically use the bicycle just like a normal bicycle. So when you pedal, the wheel sees what you do with your feet, and then it learns. It imitates anything from your cadence to your power output, torque output. It realizes what's the slope of the road you're on, and then integrates seamlessly with your motion. The experience is just like riding a bike, but you think that the ground sort of shrunk underneath you, or a hill disappeared. It's quite magical. Now, you can also uh, control this thing with your phone. So you, you, you lock and unlock it. Uh, it will only work for you, and it's a conduit. The phone is a conduit for a whole bunch of data, data about your body, data about the health of the system itself, uh, and data about the, about the environment you ride in. You can also write apps for this, just like you write uh, for, uh, for a smartphone. Now, if you're uh, more of the competitive type, you can think of this like a legal performance enhancer. <laughs> and uh, here, here's just a quick example of, uh, of what it's like uh, to ride the wheel. So 
We put a GoPro on the back of a wheel. You can see on the right, it's the app. You can switch modes, and uh, you can also create your own modes that basically change the profile of how much this thing assists you. It can make you up to 10 times stronger. Right? And then if you're a geek below, you get the whole bunch of data, your torque output, your power output, your cadence, calories output, uh, a lot of types of data. And you also um, have a system in the back end that you uh, don't know about at all that's continuously monitoring the health of the wheel itself so that it's safe. Anything from temperature in multiple places, bus voltage, making sure that the system is healthy. So if we uh, take inspiration uh, from what happened when people uh, claimed part of Times Square, and look at how nice it is to move through it today, and imagine what would it be like when entire cities are being uh, traversed through by lighter, smaller, uh, and, and, and softer modes of transport, uh, this could be uh, quite a compelling future. Now, we've brought a few bikes for you guys to try and play, uh, and play with. It's at the entrance to the left. So go try, have fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>